Hello, CFLPA Academy. My name is Scott Armstrong, and we're joined today with Jason. We are your managers for your academy. And today, the great folks at the Enriched Academy have reached out to us yet again. I'd like to uh, welcome Arian Bazai, who is the VP of uh, Market Research. He's a speaker on financial literacy. He's got a great YouTube presence. We also have Heather joining us from the Enriched Academy offices. So we'd like to welcome you as well, Heather. Now, today, what we're talking about is that thing called the stock market and investing. And whether you're a newbie investor and just trying to understand some of the basic terminology or trying to get a little more guidance on how to, to invest your money or maybe not even invest your money in these tumultuous COVID times. And as we come out of COVID, there's so many things that we have going on right now. So, Arian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Really looking forward to this. And uh, if any of you have any questions as you are viewing this, this will be on a recorded basis. Um, just right off the top, Arian, how best can anybody who's watching this get a hold of you or Heather to have questions answered? Yeah, well, first off, Scott and Jason, thank you so much for having us. We're excited for today's class to talk about the stock market support at enrichedacademy.com is the best place to reach out to us. And we do encourage you, any questions you have, please do ask. Mm -hmm. And yeah, today we're going to be talking about the stock market. 2020 was such a crazy year with the pandemic and everything that happened and so many different predictions. And I think a lot of people didn't expect what happened to happen. And 2021 has been another really um, more consistent year, but again, a lot of people were predicting a major market crash in 2021, and we're not seeing that. So today's class, we're going to go through a recap of what happened in 2020 and how to really prepare your investments for the rest of this year and the years going forward. And we're going to discuss some of the major events that happened in 2020. Of course, we had the pandemic that affected uh, so many of us. We had lockdowns. We had a Federal Reserve stimulus that was unheard of, which really what that means is the governments were printing so much money. Um, in Canada, we had CERB, where people were getting a couple thousand dollars a month. In the U.S., there was just these, these checks that were going out, and not just to individuals, but to companies. So these governments were printing a lot of money. Uh, we had a vaccine rollout in 2020, more in 2021. And we also had the 2020 US election. So we had a lot of different things happening um, in 2020. Now, this is the S&P 500. I updated this for today. So it's May 28th, 2021. Um, if you take a look at the past couple of years, you could see some dips. Um, 2019, we had a dip. 2018, we had a little dip, as you can see there. But look at 2020. That's that major 30% drop that we saw because of COVID-19. Now, what's happened since then has been astonishing. And we've seen an 83% rebound since then, which is unbelievable. And this is what we've seen in the history of the stock market. Whenever there's a recession, or even a depression, the markets go down, but they rebound with vengeance. They not just go back to normal highs, they go back to new highs. And um, the one thing about the stock market, how it works, it always goes up and down, but it always goes up and down in an upward uh, like direction. So mm -hmm. new highs, new lows, new highs, new lows. Um, so if you study the stock market, it's always gone up. There's never been a time in history where the market has crashed and it hasn't recovered. Now, I love this chart because the best way to try and anticipate the future is by looking at the past. So let's go back in time and look at the major market declines. So if you could look at the first one, 1957, there was a market crash. Um, how long did it take to get to the bottom? 70 days. Basically what that means is when it crashed, how long did it take to go to the very bottom? The percentage decline was 20%. And then how long did it get, how long did it take to get back to the top? So 227 days. So it crashed really fast, 70 days, but it took a lot longer just to break even. And then the next 12 months, you see a really great recovery of 
So when That's you take cool. a look at all these different dates, the markets crash, but they always rebound. Can I ask, Gary, in the, with the one we've just had, it's it's the shortest duration in terms of how long to get to the bottom. And it rose again so quickly and so significantly. Uh, you know, I know someone's going to ask this question, so please defer it if you want to answer later. But, you know, does it qualify as a true market crash in the sense that it adjusted or, you know, it readjusted everything back to a normal level? Or was it just a temporary crash uh, brought on by COVID? In other words, do you think there's something else still around the corner? It's a great question, Scott. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the different predictions. But to me and to a lot of economists, yes, this, that was a market crash. Anything above 20% decline is considered a market crash. But you're right. It was so unique. It was so fast. It was just 30 days. And honestly, it was so fast that it was hard to invest more, right? You didn't have you had a really short window of opportunity to invest. And if you just waited a week or two weeks, your opportunity is, is like gone. So um, is there something around the corner? I don't know. Um, I don't think so, but who knows? And we'll talk a little bit about predictions and what to expect going forward. I'm going to show you what could happen, why it could go down, and why it could keep going up. One question before we leave this, because I think this is a really important chart. I'm taking a look right in the middle there at 1982, and I'm seeing the stats are pretty similar to, to 2020. Not to put you on the spot, but what can we learn from something like that that one case study that's similar to this? Or, or what was different about that crash that was you know, so short-lived? Do you, do you have a, a quick caveat to that one? Yeah, so 1987, I can't remember exactly what that crash was. Um, but when you take a look at some of those, the ones like 1987, um, even look at 65 days, right? Yeah, 30, that's 39 days for it to get back to the bottom. Um, it's interesting, like even 1957, 70 days. Um, it, what's so unique and one of my favorite words uh, that uh, I believe it was Burt Malachy, he said, so one of the, the four most expensive sentences is this time is different. Whenever a market crash happens, people say, oh, no, this time is different. And you could see by the results, it never is. They always rebound. Um, pandemics, 2009 was the banking crisis. Guys, the banks went bankrupt. Like, that's not normal. That, that, is, that is a cause for concern if the banks are going bankrupt. We still recovered. 2000 was that tech bubble. Um, so you look at all these scenarios and they're all different. That's the thing. They're all different. And the future crashes will always be different as well, but the results will always be the same. We'll always recover. If we don't recover, we have bigger concerns than the stock market. You're talking about like some major things happening in the world like that are not good. One thing I do remember, because I'm probably the only one old enough, to, I was in banking in 1982. <laughs> but yeah. prime, prime interest rate at that point was 10.25. So the interest rates were a lot higher as well. So that may have been one of the differences. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if you take a look at some of the stock markets, um, I'll, I'll go through some of the different ones. You have the US stock market went down by 30%, and then it went up by 68%. And the 2020 return was 18%. So overall, 2020 was a great year. If you had $1,000, you made 180. If you had $100,000, you made $18,000. If you held from the start of the year and you didn't sell. Um, if you take a look at Canada, it was actually a tough year in 2020. Um, it was, we had a little bit of a bigger decline and we didn't see that increase uh, like we did in the US. And the return was 2.17. You take a look at the US NASDAQ. This is tech. This is a lot of technology companies. Um, and those did really well in 2020. You look at Microsoft, Zoom, Apple, everyone's going working from home online. A big decline of 29%, 49% increase. And then the 2020 return overall was 43%. So really great year in 2020. And then you look at China, Shanghai, uh, didn't have a huge decrease, right? If you remember, guys, the pandemic in China was short. Like it was one month, two months. Canada, Toronto, I'm in Toronto. 
we've been at this for like over a year. We've been on lockdown. So it's been a lot more severe here. Uh, percentage increase 25%. 2020 return was about 11%. The biggest lesson when I look at this is diversification. Never have all your money in one country. A lot of Canadians have all their money parked in Canadian funds. And if you did that in 2020, you missed out on some of the great returns that you saw in the U.S. and around the world. So diversification is key. Arian, just before, if you can go yeah. back to that slide, half of our members are U.S. based, you know, and mm. approximately half in Canada. And you know, the TSX, uh, the Canadian exchange, I'm looking at that 2.17%. That is the outlier of those stats that you have here in the sense that that's the one you don't want to. If I'm a Canadian player and I want to invest in U.S. stocks, um, you know, just what would be your best advice to start looking at U.S. stocks? Because some players have yet to really invest, whether through an advisor or on, or on their own. Oh, that's a great question, Scott. And the best way to invest in the U.S., if you're a Canadian uh, citizen or an American citizen, wherever you reside, is through these index funds and these ETFs. So an index fund, uh, which all of your members have access to watch the stock market training on the back end, um, but it's basically a fund that you buy. And inside that fund, you have exposure to hundreds of different American companies. And what's great about that is you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. You're not saying, you know what, I think Apple will go up. Let me just bet on Apple. Um, you're betting on 500 of the best of the best companies. Um, and if you do that, you can do that as a Canadian. Buy a Canadian, in Canadian dollars, you can buy a fund that tracks the top 500 U.S. companies. Good. Thank you. Yeah, so index funds and ETFs, a great resource if you go online, if you search top index funds in Canada or in America, you'll get amazing lists. So to talk about some of the biggest lessons learned in 2020, I think the biggest one is turn off the news. Uh, if you were getting a lot of your financial information from uh, YouTube or CNN, you have to really understand how these media outlets make money. They make money from advertisers and the advertisers pay for people to watch the news. So how do you get people to watch the news? Pessimism and predictions. Those are the two biggest ones. Um, pessimism and pre predictions. So I'll give you an example. If you look at YouTube, look at some of these positive videos. The road to economic and stock market recovery in 2020. Great. Um, this one, spending stimulus suggests strong economic rebound for 2021. And this is what we've actually seen the first six months of 2021. But look at these ones. These are negative. Why Granite says the next market crash will rival 1929-2000. 2.2 million views. Um, Harry Grant, stock markets to crash 40% by April. It won't rebound for decades. This was last year, so this was completely wrong, like wrong. It did not crash 40%, 1.3 million views. So you could see the news feeds off pessimism. Here's some other headlines I found. Great coronavirus crash of 2020 is different. Remember the four most expensive words in investing? This time is different, perfect example. A hellish week for the markets isn't over yet. This actually happened in March 13th. You see when it was released? That was, that was one of the lowest points in the market's crash. So it was over. <laughs> like, so that's, that's pretty funny. This one's funny to me too. Jim Cramer, yeah. on April 6th, he said, I'm convinced there will be more selling. April 6th. So if you look at the markets, April 3rd was really close. It didn't go lower than that. It just went up. So since Jim Cramer said, I am convinced there will be more selling, it just kept going up. There was no more. It didn't go lower than the point that he said it would go lower. So it's just funny to see like all these people making predictions and pessimism and ultimately no one can predict the future. Really, no one can. Um, 
So if you hear anyone on the news, if you have a friend, uncle, family member that can predict the future, stay away from those people. It's very entertaining to watch these types of videos. They're fun to watch. Like, oh, it's like, and they're very smart. That's the problem. I tell you guys, it's the biggest problem. You watch these people like Harry Dent, Burt Malachy. Um, these are smart individuals that have some very valid points and they're way smarter than all of us combined. Like these are PhD, like so, so smart, but you just can't predict the future. You can't. And Warren Buffett, uh, he said this over and over again, do not try and predict the stock market. So one of the rules I go by when it comes to investing is consume less and study more. If you want to learn about the stock market, consume less mm -hmm. online information and actually study how the stock market works. That's um, the same thing with real estate. There, Aaron. Uh, Jason, I just saw that you had a question you wanted to get in. Yeah, no, I think this is a really important point. And I love that it's talking about this niche world, niche where we're all worried about our finances, obviously. But I think it's important throughout this pandemic, the volatility of the, the vocal minority and, and the, the presence of those that are speaking very loudly, but not maybe not representing everybody, but those of us in the audience, assuming that they might be, it's, it's an interesting time for misinformation is all I'll say. And I think that that's not just in the financial industry, but I think it's, it's absolutely important to keep yourself aware of that within this world of, of knowledge, specifically when you're doing your research. So if I can segue, Arian, back, back to where you were going there, you're saying watch less and study more. Where do I study? How do I do that kind of thing? Yeah, so this is a shameless plug for Enriched Academy, <laughs> but um, you, you guys all have access to Enriched and you'll see what like our stuff is tried and true. And the way that we you know present our information, it's it just works no matter what. We're not here to tell you, um, make predictions or sell you financial products or sell you a better future. Um, but it is hard to find good information online. I'll, I'll be honest, Scott, like it, it, it's difficult. Um, and that's really that, that problem we're trying to solve with Enrich. For me, I get my information, um, it's, yeah, where do I get my information? It's a great <laughs> question. Um, Maybe it's a you know, I've been doing it for so many years, like 10 <laughs> years that I, I have these new sources that I know yeah. that are reputable. I know who to look out for. Warren Buffett for me is like the, that is my go-to person. Mm -hmm. um, he just had his annual shareholder meeting a couple of weeks ago. And you could watch that on YouTube. It's, it's three hours long. That's a great place to go. So I like to study the people that have a proven track record. Not some kid on YouTube that's making videos um, for one to two weeks um, yeah. and is making all these predictions, but study the people that have that track record. So I would really love your opinion on this one, Arian, because you mentioned Warren Buffett and he's all about value investing. He'll sit on billions of dollars until prices come down. And he's come out and said, uh, it's hard to find undervalued prices right now. It's mm -hmm. so, so inflated. So there's value investing on one thing. And maybe the other sexy topic of the moment is Bitcoin, you know, electronic yeah. currency where people are making oodles of money. Everybody, right? <laughs> According to the news, everybody's making oodles of money. If you're to you know, sit down with a player and say, listen, this is your first time investing. I know a lot of the players talk about that quick buck, but how should yeah. they decide between trying to go for a short-term home run versus a long-term you know, game where you're, you're in it for that seven, 8%, 10% each year? What would you advise or, I think you're getting an idea of what I'm asking. That's a great question, Scott. And it's funny, all of my friends, the same thing, they're trying to get that home run. And I think it's okay, and I do too. I invest in cryptocurrencies and these uh, altcoins, um, I do. But you know, for, for myself and what we recommend is take a certain percentage of your portfolio, 10%, maybe 20% if you really want to take a risk and put a cap on it. You're going to say, you know what, I'm going to invest in Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, some other ones if you'd like, and I will not invest more than 20% or $20,000, whatever that dollar amount is. And I'm okay losing this money. You, you have to be okay. These are high risk investments. So you need to come to peace with yourself. 
that you're going to lose this money. But hey, if you lose it, it's okay because 80% of your money is in these long-term safe investments. So I would say you should try and have a little bit of fun. And I wouldn't want to use the word gamble, but just tr try out these, these yeah. different types of investments, but do not let it get more than 10, 20% of your, your investment portfolio. And when we're looking at the values, we often look at share price as a way to determine whether winning or losing. And, and you take a look at a stock like Enbridge, which actually has a dividend of around 8%. I mean, 8% on money, just uh, whether the stock price goes up or down is, is still a pretty good deal. Uh, is that something we should look at as a as not just on capital appreciation, but more on, on dividend or earnings dispersals? No, it's a great question, Scott. So there's really two ways to invest in the stock market. Number one, you could be a more passive investor which is where you're buying these index funds and these ETFs. So you're not trying to pick and choose the one or two stocks that are going to really change your life. And trying to pick stocks, you absolutely can, but it is a hard, hard game. 92% um, of actively managed funds in Canada that are managed by professional institutions fail to outperform the market. They, they don't make money. They lose money. Um, so trying to pick stocks, I do, um, but I spent a lot of time as well as money being in these like inner circles and these groups of experts that are recommending different things to look out for. Um, so passive investing is a little bit safer. It's, you, it's not as much of a headache as well as you're not going to spend as much time researching individual stocks, um, but you can have both. I do both personally. I have long-term index funds. I have individual stocks and I also have cryptocurrencies as well. So absolutely, you can do all three. Thanks. Yeah, great questions. Uh, number three lesson is emotions are your enemy. Most people are losing money in the stock market and they are the worst enemy by far. Uh, here's a really interesting uh, stats that we pulled up. The average return in the stock market is an 8 to 12% return over the past 100 years. Uh, these are mostly for the American and Canadian markets. If you look at the individual investor, um, which is like myself or a, a Canadian or American that's trying to just invest on their own, picking stocks or picking funds and trying to buy and sell on their own, their average return is only 3.8%. So how is it possible that their return is so much lower than the stock market it's because they buy at the wrong times and they sell at the wrong times, and it's 100% emotion. If you look at the average equity fund, these are professionally managed funds that banks, um, hedge funds that manage billions of dollars, they're only getting a 5.19% return. So what this, teach, what this tells me is Emotions are uh, an enemy. It's very difficult to outperform the market. It's very difficult to buy and uh, or pick stocks that'll do really well. And even these equity funds, again, that are professionally managed, I have some of the smartest people working for them, like Harvard graduates, they still underperform the market by a, by a huge margin. Um, so big lesson when you take a look at that. I love this tweet from Naval. He says, making money through an early lucky trade is the worst way to win. The bad habits that it reinforces will lead to a lifetime of losses. And it's so true. It's like going to the casino. The, the, number, thing, the, the number one thing the casino wants when you enter is for you to get that win. You know, get that win early on because then you get that high and you're like, oh, yeah, like I want that again. And you just keep chasing it. And that's that's tough because you will lose money eventually. You know, it's, <laughs> it's funny you said that. You see the saxophone over the left shoulder, my area in the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was in grade 10, I invested for the very first time and I put in a hundred bucks and I had a 10 banger. Well, you know, so I got a thousand and I thought, how easy is this? And I bought the saxophone with that money. I don't think I won again for three or four years. It was because of that early win. So just <laughs> <That's> <laughs> hilarious. you need the tread yeah. mark. No, it's, it's so many great lessons that you learn. One of my first investments was I had a friend and uh, his grandpa had a mining company and it was a brand new company and it was, it was like four cents to buy a share. So I put all my money I had, it was like 10,000 at the time in grade 10 and 
went to zero, um, just lost all that money. So it's these, these lessons that you learn. Um, but even if that company went and did really well, that probably would have been worse for me than if it went bankrupt. So um, those early trades, those early wins, watch out for them. Here's some of the market strategies that we shared last year with our students. Um, right in the middle of the pandemic, we said, do these four things. Number one, you should be dollar cost averaging weekly. Now, what does dollar cost averaging mean? It's where you're investing a regular amount on a consistent basis. So if you have $100,000 or $1,000, instead of investing it all at once, you invest it over time. And what that allows you to do, it allows you to take advantage of the ups and downs of the market. So as a stock market is going down, most people are selling, but we were telling our students to buy. Now, a lot of our students were coming to us and they were saying, Arian, I have $100,000, should I buy right now? And we said, no, maybe you should buy, take that $100,000 and invest $10,000 every week for 10 weeks. Um, so you're not investing all at once, you're investing over time. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it absolutely does. Because particularly going forward, nobody knows if there's another plunge coming up or whether we're going up. So are you telling us that it's moderating the effect? that you're gonna protect yourself against a lot of downturn on that. Absolutely, yeah. It just protects you from the ups and downs of the market and it just creates some consistency in such an inconsistent stock market. Um, we also recommended, hey, you know what? Take a certain percentage of your money, if you have it and you're okay losing it and invest in some risky things. Go look at banking. Banking took a huge hit. Uh, I can't imagine banking not rebounding, which it, it has. Airlines riskier, travel, risky. Um, but these are all industries that have done well. They've rebounded. You look at cruise lines, they've rebounded. Expedia has rebounded um, airlines. So that paid off for a lot of our students, which was nice to see. Again, quick wins. Those are, you don't see this opportunity of 2020 come around very often. The last time we had a market crash was 2008. That's 12 years. We didn't see a market downturn like this. So if you're okay taking a little risk, it was the time to take some risk for sure. I think that's also a really good point when you talk about what I've been watching, at least personally on the crypto side of mm -hmm. things is the volatility is so high with that type of investment that the, the long play tends to be a very predictable way to at least hedge exactly that, where a day you can see the highest and the lowest within a month because it's so volatile. It's so volatile. Well, just a couple, I think last week, it, was, it went down 40% cryptocurrencies. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, you know what I'm going to buy? And I just, honestly, I just got too busy. I was like, I was, I was working. And then all of a sudden it goes back up and you're like, oh my God. So it's these opportunities, um, they're tough because you can go crazy just watching, 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 watching. And so this is why even for my cryptocurrency, I dollar cost average. I say, you know what? Every month invest a thousand dollars, put 500 into Bitcoin, put 250 into Ethereum, another 250 in some altcoins. And you know what? That's going to happen every single month, no matter what. Um, but when you see those big downturns, it's okay to say, you know what, let me let me put in a little bit more. Now, now seems like a good time. That's totally fine to do. If I could, Aaron, you just brought up a really good point. And if you want to defer this to the end is a lot of people, when they start getting into the market, they're laser focused for a week or two. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it wears off. And then yeah. they forget and all these things happen. Some of them aren't good. Um, should people be managing their own money or should they have some sort of professional management? Just, uh, I know that's a, you may not be able to. That's a great question. It's it a fantastic back. question, Scott. I think it really depends on your situation. You kind of got to do a real good self audit on, on yourself. Mm -hmm. If you like for myself, um, and what we recommend to our students, if you want to do it on your own, you absolutely can, but you're going to need to dedicate 30 minutes to an hour a week right? Or excuse me, a month, 30 minutes to an hour a month. The setup is going to take you time. It'll take you between five to 10 hours to set up your TFSA, the automatic transfers, your self-directed. Um, if you do not want to do it on your own, you can get a financial advisor 
Or you could look at something like a robo advisor, where a robo advisor manages your money for you through technology. They charge you a very, very low fee, extremely low. And it's a hybrid between doing it on your own and getting a financial advisor. So to answer your question, Scott, I think it really depends on the individual. Um, but be ready to spend an hour a month just, you know, and have a good plan in place. You know, it's important to have a step-by-step -step plan that you follow every single month. And it shouldn't be different month over month. It should be like, okay, step one, step two, step three, step four. Same thing over and over again each month. But it takes time to develop those things. Yeah. My thought too is that, you know, if you take a look at your other habits, if you're a good starter of things, but not a good follow through or completer, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to have that kind of situation because that's where the the big things can happen because you get excited for a month and then you just forget about it. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. and you still have all those transfers going in and things like that. So, uh, you know, Absolutely. if you feel yourself that you're good disciplined, you know, maybe take a shot at it. Anyway, just oh, 100 percent there that I'm licking. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, and to your point, Scott, the more you can automate your finances, the better. We preach this so much at Enrich. You don't want to create another job for yourself and spend 10 hours a month managing your money. Automate your savings, your investing. Um, there's a great book called The Automatic Millionaire by David Bach, and he just talks about just try and automate everything. Even something as simple as your credit card uh, bill. Um, people like do the, the transfer from their checking to pay their credit card. Um, you can automate that and just have the money automatically be paid. So you don't have to worry about a missed payment. You don't have to worry about not paying on time. And, and you're not going logging in 10 minutes a month to do that one thing. Mm -hmm. um, try and automate everything. Beautiful. I love this quote from Warren Buffett. Be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've heard of this a thousand times, but it's the basic concepts that will make you wealthy, not the new flashy uh, ones that no. that are good for a month, but then they fizzle off. No, that's a beautiful one. Yeah. Another lesson, the stock market is not logical. If you're trying to logically understand, wait a minute, 2020, we had a pandemic. There's a lockdown. Businesses are closed. Debt is at an all-time high. We're printing money. Why is the stock market going up? I'll tell you right now, like people were confused by what was going on. It's because the stock market is not logical. And the stock market and the economy are two separate things, completely separate. The stock market is the perception that people have of the economy, not of the actual economy. Um, and usually the stock market is eight months ahead of the economy and what's happening in the world. So that's why you saw the market's rebounding, even though we're still in the middle of a pandemic, because the stock market is already pricing in a vaccine, things going back to normal, things going, they've already, that's already accounted for. Um, so you really got to be 12 months ahead. Um, the stock market is always 12 months ahead. Uh, here's a perfect example of GameStop. For those of you that heard what happened here, um, this is a company that, if, if you haven't heard, they sell physical video games at a store. You go to like EB Games in Canada, uh, GameStop. And for, since the beginning of time, it never traded more than $50 a share. Right now, it's at over $300 a share. Um, if you take a look at the sales and the profit since 2017, it's just been going lower and lower and lower. So how is it possible that something that keeps going down in value the stock price goes up. Now, this is a unique scenario because this is where Wall Street bets and a group of Reddit um, users have all come together to push this up. And this is just an example of, again, the stock market is not logical. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And if you try to make sense of it, you're going to have a hard time, especially in the short term, month to month movements. We could pause. I think what you said was was so poignant is that the stock market is a representation of our perspective of the economy. And I think that is philosophically the underpinning of why crypto is even more volatile, because now we're talking about an intangible asset to that true degree. Right. And I think it's interesting based purely off of that point.
Absolutely. Well, the cryptocurrency has such a strong community behind it. Like, and Warren Buffett, it's interesting to hear his views on cryptocurrency. He's not a big believer at all, him and his partner, Charlie Munger. Um, but it's the community that is so strong behind crypto. Um, it's, it's really amazing to see um, that perception of what this can be driving it forward. It's amazing. Great point, Jason. There was a neat uh, uh, sort of segue in there and that when you mentioned Warren Buffett area and, you know, he's uh, late eighties, Charlie's in his nineties. And at, at some point, uh, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett's a big fan of Coca-Cola. He's a big fan of utilities. Uh, he may not be that ultimate tech investor that you would look to. He may not fully get the, the modern economy, you know, type of piece. So I, I think uh, it just pointed out that there's all, you know, within the stock market, there's a lot of different sub segments that you can, oh, yeah. you, know, you need to have expertise that's dialed into your specific sector rather than just getting a generalist opinion at times. Such a great point, Scott. Absolutely. So here's just a quick 2021 report. This is very updated as of today. Um, the US market is up 13%. Uh, the Canadian market, we've seen a great rebound. So 2020 was a lag, but hey, we're actually outperforming the U.S. so far, which is which is interesting. Fourteen percent. Now the technology has taken a really. It, it's not taken a hit, but it's gone a lot slower. Remember, forty-two percent in twenty twenty, only seven percent this year, and the China Shanghai is at around three percent this year as well. Now, why the stock market could go down from here? Um, Number one is un unemployment, which has been an issue. Um, and as things open up, starting to get better. Increased lockdown, which I think we're past that at this point. The U.S. is definitely past that. Canada, we're still in there. Could there be a, which wave are we on? I don't, I don't even remember. Are we on wave like seven? Like there could be another wave, um, right? Third wave. In inflation is a, is a little bit scary right now. Um, you could see the cost of living is going through the roof, um, both in North America. Um, that's definitely a concern. Uh, the amount of debt. So here are the reasons it could go down. Why could the stock market continue to go up? The vaccine rollout has been very promising in the US. Um, it's looking pretty good in Canada. Increase optimism. You know, as Jason mentioned, it's all about perception. The perception right now is really good. If people are positive about what's happening. A lot of the people that sold um, when the pandemic happened are coming back into the market, right? Um, which is just increasing the price. I think the biggest thing that we've learned uh, in 2020 is the Federal Reserve will do anything they can to keep the market's healthy to keep the economy rolling. They will print out money. They will go to extremes to make sure that we don't go in a depression. So you have the backing of the Federal Reserve and businesses reopening. Um, so I'm not here to tell you what's gonna happen. These are the pros and th those are the cons. We're not here to make predictions. Can I add one more thing, just the negative one to get yeah. your opinion on this is that with the challenges you know, that the market may go down is, Stock prices used to be based on a, a times of earnings, you know, and two, three, or four times earnings and, and five. You know, we have companies now that are evaluated at 15 or 20 times earnings, which is a whole new way of evaluating a stock. Um, you know, just your perception on it, is that realistic? Can that go on or are we in a, you know, inflated bubble? And I know we can't predict the future. I'm just... Yeah. having a discussion about this. No, it's a great question. Well, the price to earnings that you're looking at, which was such a key indicator for the stock market for years. Um, you know, I think right now when it look, when you look at the price to earnings, um, you have to use it as something that you you relate it and not as a benchmark, but you have to use it as a benchmark to compare companies to. Um, so for example, Right now, I would look at the price to earnings of the overall S&P 500 and then an individual stock to see, okay, is this thing really overvalued or undervalued? But again, it's so like, and I've spent, guys, I've spent a lot of money on stock market education. I'm in memberships that cost 
thousands upon thousands of dollars a year to be in, um, where there's education about how to value a company, how to find out if they're undervalued. It's hard. It's really, really difficult. Um, and there's just so many different components from price to earnings to um, the competitive advantage, the leadership of the company, their competitive moat. There's so many different things to look at. And it's not impossible to do, but you know, it's not easy. And that's why you see those big hedge funds getting a 5% return when the overall stock market is getting an 8 to 12% return. So um, and I'm not sure if that answered your question, Scott. It's it's a challenge. It is I don't know if there was an answer to it, but you did a great <laughs> job giving me more information. So thank yeah. you. Great job. Awesome. All right. So the golden rule, I think, you know, even maybe to help answer your question, Scott, is whether the markets go up or down, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter because you should still be making money. If they continue to go down, you're holding and you're collecting dividends from your index funds, ETFs, or the individual stocks. And dividends are payouts that companies give to shareholders and people that own the investment. And remember, it will recover. It, it will recover, so be patient. Uh, this is just the last thing is the election. And uh, this was interesting to take a look at because what it shows is the return in the stock market under a Republican uh, democracy or a Democrat, right? And you look at the Democrat, 11% when the Republican was 1.71%. So to a lot of people, they would think that the re having a Republican government is better because they're more business focused or whatever it might be, but it's actually not even close to what the actual stats are. So for people that are worried about that, that's just something to, to take a look at. So what should be your 2021 stock market strategy? Number one, you want to diversify across asset classes, industries, countries, and currencies. You don't want to have all your money in Canada or the US, or you don't want to have all your money in Tesla or Apple. Diversify uh, so that if one country goes down or whatever happens, you're not going to be panicking. Number two is your asset allocation. It's really important um, and what your asset allocation is where your money is, which kind of relates to number one. Um, you don't want to have all your money in one asset class. You want to have it diversified across different places, which can include cryptocurrency as well as real estate um, and other asset classes. Um, in the Enriched Academy course that you guys all have access to, uh, we go into more detail and give you examples of different asset allocations. That's a whole course on its own, but that's really important. Number three is continue to invest regularly. And number four is stick to your plan. Um, have a plan in place and stick to it. Uh, don't let the emotions change your plan. So that's kind of a quick recap of 2021. Again, this isn't a, a stock market education. Um, class, I think if you've never done any education on the stock market, this is going to confuse you so much. Um, so uh, hopefully if, you know, if you're watching this, this may have motivated you to keep learning and learn some of the fundamentals of how the stock market works. Um, so guys, again, thank you so much for having me, Scott and Jason. I hope this was helpful and, um, and enjoyable. Arian, this is a, uh, I think we could talk for hours and, 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 yeah. and I really enjoy this conversation. So thank you for opening that. So if I've listened to this now as a player or one of the spouses or partners who are listening and I want to take the next step, then the Enriched Academy through its partnership with the CFLPA Academy uh, has uh, access to courses. And Jason, what's the best way for players to access that? Glad you asked so I can go for my shameless plug. You go to <laughs> CFLPA.com slash academy and once you've logged in as a player um, the same way that you would access salary information or, or other information regarding collective bargaining um, you will see a blue little button that will get you right in streamlined and have full access to the full portfolio of rich academy uh, teachings yes and, awesome. and, and we've taken i've done the course uh, and i know jason's done it as well it is top tier guys it really is there's checks for understanding. It is well worth the time to get in there and do that. And as the economy opens up, Arian, if you're ever out here in BC or I'm in Toronto, wherever you are, I want to hear you speak. Uh, you guys do have some speaking engagements on a normal economy session. Is that right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're actually known for our events. It's really the foundation of Enriched is uh, we come out and we do these uh, fun, interactive, engaging events on on this topic of money, because I think all of us, we I love money. I don't know about you guys. I'm not in a greedy way, but I I enjoy money. And the reason I enjoy it is because um, I don't want to be controlled by money. I want to be able to live the type of life I want to. And I know that money is going to it plays a major role in that. So let me learn how this thing works so that I could use it to my advantage instead of being taken advantage of by it. And the stock market is a small section. There's so much more um, to learn, um, but hopefully we make it, we'll make it simple for you, easy. And that's what the events are all about. Fantastic. So if we need to have a part two to this podcast on another thing to do with investing, are you guys up for that? Oh, a hundred percent. Let us know guys, what you guys want to hear about. You want to hear about cryptocurrency. I could talk about that for, for two I'll hours. My questions on NFTs for the next time. Okay. Done. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys let us know for, for those of you that are watching, what do you want to learn more about? Let us know. And uh, you can email support at enriched Academy or reach out to Scott or Jason, and we're happy to, to do more training. That's fantastic. Aaron, Heather, you know, on behalf of uh, Jason and I, Thank you so much. This has just been an absolute delight. Uh, I always learn so much when I hear you guys speak. You guys are a fantastic resource. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having us, Scott yeah, and Jason. It's okay. a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Uh, you guys have been a great partner, and uh, we we look forward to continue to, to help any way that we can. And this is fun for us. This is not work. We're having fun. <laughs> Another thing we have in common. All right, guys, if you've been watching this, head on over to the Enriched Academy. Talk, contact Jason and I will help you continue your journey along. For the Academy for this session, guys, we're going to say goodbye.